and it is Prime Minister Golda Meir who will be speaking freely today. Mr. Mayor, I wonder whether we might begin by speaking of Arab groups of the kind that hijack airplanes and killed Israeli athletes in Munich. They talked a great deal about the Palestinian homeland and how they've been deprived of it. Is there any legitimacy in talk about an Arab-Palestinian homeland? No, I think not. At any rate, if uh, the homeland that is referred to is supposed to be Israel, I think it would be worthwhile just to take a minute, go back a little bit in history. For instance, between the, before the First World War, there were uh, no independent Arab countries. This area that is Israel today, and as a matter of fact, up to the Jordan, was considered uh, the southern part of Syria. When after the war, the uh, Great Britain got the uh, mandate over Palestine. Palestine was then between the entire area, between the Mediterranean and the Iraqi border. All of that was Palestine. There was one high commissioner and considered one, one country. The first partitioning of Palestine took place in 1922, when after the war, uh, Great Britain saw fit to parcel out this area of the Middle East and give part of it uh, to every one of the sheikhs who were helpful in the war. They had to do something also for Abdullah. So they partitioned Palestine, made the western part of, Pal of the Jordan River, Palestine. The eastern part was called Transjordan. The second time Palestine was partitioned was in 47, of course. Now, but until 22, all of that was one country, it was one Palestine. Of course, in, uh, in Transjordan, over this Jordan today, there are Bedouins, there are others, but you will not find one single country in this area, an Arab country, that hasn't various groups of Arab people. So to call, to say that there is a Palestinian people as a part from those that are in Jordan, especially, uh, this is not true to, to fact, and not true to history. Now, between 48 and 67, after the War of Liberation, and the Western Bank was uh, later annexed by Abdullah, they were there. I, uh, they were the majority in Jordan if they wanted to set up uh, a state or to call that state a Palestine, of course, they didn't have to ask our permission and uh, we would have had nothing to do with it. Therefore, when they say the Palestinian people want the right to their land, what, what it really means is to drive the Jews out of this area and take over in addition to the about 19 or 20 independent Arab countries, all that have been created between the First and Second World War, create one more country instead of Israel. This is uh, really what it's meant. What, what, what then is the significance of the acts of terror that we see, the acts of pressure and propaganda of various kinds? Why then do these people behave as they do? They don't want us here. But uh, to my sorrow, it isn't only they that do not want us here. Who are they? They're the people who, because of the War of 48, fled this area into Jordan, into Syria, and other places, and have never been resettled. 
Those that were refugees. And uh, certainly I admit, one has to admit it, that as far as, as from the humanitarian point of view, there are groups of hundreds of thousands of people who have lived uh, in camps for uh, so many years under miserable conditions. Why haven't they been resettled? Jordan actually was not viable without these people. Jordan has a population of maybe about 300,000. Uh, why weren't they not resettled? Some of them were. But generally, why was there not a resettlement of refugees, of the Arab refugees? Because not only the refugees, but the Arab countries themselves felt that they should remain in their camps. They should not be resettled. It was one of the weapons against Israel. There were military uh, measures, there were uh, there's economic boycott, and one of the methods was to keep the refugees in the camp, uh, feeding a hope that someday they'll march into the country and march us out. So um, they don't like us, they don't want us here. Our Arab neighbors to my sorrow, have not yet acquiesced to our existence, therefore wars. And uh, it's all one problem, really, that the Arabs in this area, in the immediate area, are not prepared to live in peace with us. Mr. Mayor, it appears from what you say that you accept that Palestinians, or whatever you want to call them, refugees, have been made victims one way or another that they have a legitimate grievance. Uh, what can be done to meet their grievance? Then? They have become victims through the fact that after the United Nations in 47 decided on the partitioning of Palestine, mind you, west of the Jordan River, into a Jewish state and an Arab state. We accepted. And uh, the Arab countries did not. And there was war. Can't imagine that there ever was a war without refugees. The difference is, in this case, that uh, the Arab people who fled the area that became Israel afterwards were actually among their own people. For instance, uh, we Jews are a classic nation of refugees. But uh, when we were refugees, we were uh, among strangers with the different people who had different religions, who spoke a different language, a different culture, entirely different. These people are among their own people. It's the same language, the same religion, the same way of life. The fact that a line was uh, drawn didn't make them any difference. And, uh, but that they suffered, I accept. The question is, was that necessary? Because during that period, during these years, Israel has absorbed from the Arab countries a much larger number of Jews than the number of Arabs that left this area. Uh, nobody speaks of uh, Iraqi Jewish refugees in, uh, in Israel, or uh, Syrian Jewish refugees, or Moroccan Jewish refugees. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, anybody that knows the situation will agree that uh, there was a greater clash between European Jews that came here or Israeli Jews who have been here for centuries, generations, and Jews that came from Yemen or Jews that came from, uh, let's say, the Atlas Hills in Morocco. The only thing that really um, made us one was religion. We we're Jews. We we're one of the same nation but no common language and uh, sometimes uh, centuries apart in culture 
and yet we absorb them and uh, we're one people. Is there anything, Mrs. Prime Minister, that Israel can do to remove this, this center of infection, really, the source of infection for the whole Middle East, these Arab refugees, these unsatisfied, unhappy people, unsettled, really? Because going around, as I've been doing the last few days, one still sees refugee camps that go back to 1948. Is there anything that Israel can do? We have said immediately after the war, after the War of Liberation in 48, 49, that uh, we are prepared to pay compensation for anything that these the people have left behind, whether it's uh, land, whether it's orange groves, whether it's houses, anything. We have uh, allowed tens of thousands of them to come back because families were separated during the fighting. And if part of the families remain here, and if they have uh, no problem of security, we allow them to come back. Now, the United Nations had a committee to investigate what these people left behind. And we cooperated with them. It comes up uh, large sums of money. Now, if there had been peace, this money, uh, the aid from international aid and from various governments, there's no doubt this thing would have been forgotten. And they would have been resettled in agriculture or in industry or in any other way. Instead, the United Nations during these years poured hundreds of millions of dollars into miserable camps. We found the camps now, for instance, in the Gaza Strip. It's, uh, it's unheard of that people should be kept in, uh, in conditions of that kind. But it was done with this idea, the worse the better. These people must be miserable. They must live in conditions of that kind. They must not resettle and have a home of their own or so on. And so that uh, they will be an instrument against Israel. 